Hi, this is your Russian Rulers podcast host, Mark Schaus. I'm interrupting today's podcast all the way from episode 108 to make a short announcement. I've created a new blog site for all things having to do with Russian history and far beyond just the rulers. You can find it at www.russianrulershistory.com. I mean, there's a lot of content there already to read about things like the Decemberist Revolt of 1825, the life of Sviatopolk the Accursed, Nikita Khrushchev, and much, much more. Of course, there's also a small little PayPal donation button there if you want to help support the podcast. It would be much appreciated. Now, on to the podcast. Welcome to the Russian Rulers History Podcast, Episode 94, Khrushchev meets the world. Last episode, we saw how Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev survived a coup attempt led by seven members of the Presidium. Purged out of the ruling elite, four of the leaders, Malenkov, Molotov, Shepelov, and Kaganovich, were sent into internal exile, never to wield power again. Khrushchev began to consolidate his power and focus on a new target the outside world. Now, to say that Khrushchev had not focused on foreign affairs before the June coup would be terribly incorrect. He actually traveled quite extensively after Stalin's death. He went to China in 1954, was part of the negotiating team that headed to Geneva in 1955, traveled through India, Burma, and Afghanistan that same year, and toured Great Britain in 1956. The problem the first secretary had was the fact that before he came to power, Stalin did not allow him to receive any information about foreign affairs, as he kept most of that to himself. As he recalled in his memoirs about how they were treated, quote, the rest of us were just errand boys, and Stalin would snarl threateningly at anyone who overstepped the mark. When he was a member of the Politburo, he was only given, quote, background material, that is, information that Stalin sent around to all the Politburo members with his decisions already attached. Because of how close to the outside world the Soviet Union was in the mid-1950s, few really understood who was in charge after Stalin's death. Most were of the opinion that Malenkov and Molotov were the natural leaders and that there was no way that Khrushchev was really the leader of the USSR, even after the June coup was put down. Many felt that Khrushchev was boorish and not very smart. Of course, that was the opinion of many in the Soviet Union, as well as in the rest. British Ambassador William Hyder found Nikita, quote, rumbustuous, impetuous, loquacious, freewheeling, and alarmingly ignorant of foreign affairs. He spoke in short sentences, in an emphatic voice with great conviction, grinning good-naturedly. He often stumbled in his choice of words and said the wrong thing, something as translator Oleg Troyanovsky discreetly corrected. He went on to report that Khrushchev was, quote, the typical peasant as he appears in the classical Russian novels of the 19th century. Sly, shrewd, suspicious, cautious under the appearance of abandon, fundamentally contemptuous of the baron, the master. When Khrushchev came to power, the relationship between Moscow and Beijing was tepid at best as Stalin viewed Mao with some contempt. Nikita tried to improve relations between 1953 and 1956 by helping them with what historian William Kirby called the greatest transfer of technology in world history. In return for all the aid the Soviet Union gave to the Chinese, Khrushchev expected much in return. He was to be bitterly disappointed. What made the relationship sour was Khrushchev's secret speech. While Mao didn't particularly like Stalin, he was developing his own cult of personality, so he was very disdainful of Stalin being so vilified. 
What Mao felt was that Stalin should have been criticized, not killed. Zhao Enlai visited the USSR in 1957 and came away with a poor impression of the Soviet leaders. They, quote, often fail to overcome subjectivity, narrow-mindedness, and emotion. They also concentrate on specific and isolated events rather than anticipating situations thoroughly from different angles. They were extremely conceited, lacking farsightedness, and knowing little of the ways of the world. Some of their leaders had hardly improved themselves, even with the several rebuffs they have met in the past year. Yet they appear to lack confidence, suffer from inner fears, and thus tend to employ the tactics of bluffing or threats in handling foreign affairs or relations with brotherly parties. By the end of 1957, Mao visited Moscow, but despite being treated like royalty, he acted disrespectfully toward his hosts. Mao was quoted as saying, Even in this communist land they know who is powerful and who is weak. What snobs! From there, the relationship just deteriorated. And what I'm going to do for you, for my loyal listeners, is to read a chapter from the book in a series of separate podcasts. And the book is Khrushchev Remembers, The Last Testament, which is the last part of his memoirs, which he taped before he died. It gives you a first-hand and admittedly biased report on the reasons behind the schism with China. My reading will be done in a number of podcasts, as it is around 80 pages long, and I hope you enjoy it. Well, now back to this podcast. Now, next up was the relationship between Moscow and Yugoslavia, and in particular its leader, Marshal Tito. When Khrushchev went to Belgrade with his delegation in tow in May 1955, he made his infamous comments blaming all the problems between Moscow and Belgrade on Beria. Tito knew right away that Nikita and the Presidium members just didn't get it. There was a reception for the Russians at the White Palace where the Yugoslavian contingent were dressed up in full regalia and their Soviet counterparts were dressed in plain baggy summer suits. Unfortunately, Khrushchev got terribly drunk and as Taubman puts it, he kept trying to kiss everyone, particularly Tito, to whom he kept cooing, Iosha, quit being angry. What a thin-skinned one you are. Drink up and let bygones be bygones. But when Khrushchev was with the common folk of Yugoslavia, he was a genius with an amazing gift to endear himself with the people. As Edward Crankshaw noted, when Nikita was at a factory in Zagreb, sitting down with the workers, quote, He was a man transformed. No longer the public clown, no longer the bullying demagogue, no longer the man showing off. His whole immense vitality was concentrated on the job at hand. He went further, went on to say, all this was done very quietly, but with an authority which was absolute. He had become, without emphasis, without raising his voice, the born and unquestioned master. All the energies, all the vitality of everyone in the room were being drained from each individual and absorbed into this little figure who knew just what he wanted and was going to get it with perfect economy of effort. For the next year and a half, Khrushchev worked hard to bring Yugoslavia back into the Soviet sphere of influence, but he was ultimately not successful. The first secretary had put much on the line trying to undo Stalin's breakup with Tito, but his boorish behavior and misunderstanding of the Yugoslavs eventually led him to condemn their revisionism and their form of socialism. While China and Yugoslavia were giving Khrushchev fits, it was the United States that concerned the Soviet leader the most. The U.S. had air force bases within Europe easily within striking distance of all major cities of the Soviet Union, and they knew it. The Soviets had an extensive atomic and hydrogen bomb program underway, but its actual ability to strike the U.S. and its number of bombs was vastly overestimated. As Taubman puts it, quote, 
U.S. intelligence estimated in 1952 that the USSR could have as many as 200 bombs by mid-1953. In fact, Moscow had no more than 120 bombs in mid-1953, and as late as 1956, it had no planes that could bomb the United States and return home. Khrushchev's concern was that while he needed to increase the Soviet military might, economically, there was no way they could accomplish it without resorting to Stalin-like forced industrialization. He could not, nor could anyone else in the Presidium, bring themselves to try that murderous approach from the 1930s again. A missile delivery system was the supposed solution that the military leaders had come up with instead. This is why the launching of Sputnik was so important to the Moscow leaders. By being first into outer space and giving the impression that they had long-range missile capabilities, the Soviets could use that threat to play brinksmanship games with the United States, who was, for all intents and purposes, far more powerful than the USSR. The talks in Geneva of July of 1955 was an important first step for the Soviets to bluster about their atomic power while curtailing what they thought were threats by the Americans to strike at the Soviet homeland first. Khrushchev and Eisenhower seemed to put personal relationships ahead of any substantive agreements at the summit. But there were hiccups throughout their time, starting with their arrival. The plane that the Russians came in was a twin-engine IL-14, while the three other delegations arrived in large four-engine planes. As Nikita's son Sergei recalls, until the day he died, he never forgot how humiliated he felt when the delegation's two-engine IL-14 landed. It looked like an insect. When they came off the plane, a Swiss honor guard stood in front of Khrushchev blocking him from standing in the front row. As Nikita remembered it, his back was up against my nose. I wasn't permitted to join in that part of the ceremony, so the Swiss government very rudely had that man stand in front of me. Bulganin was the obvious head of state, according to the three other powers at the summit, as it couldn't be Khrushchev. As Harold Macmillan wrote, Khrushchev is a mystery. How can this fat, vulgar man with his pig eyes and a ceaseless flow of talk really be the head, the aspirant czar of all these millions of people and this vast country? Nothing truly substantive came out of the Geneva talks, but the impressions of what each country might do in the future when it came to nuclear war was set. The Americans believed that, quote, the most important result of the summit was to remove from the minds of the Soviet leaders any fear that the United States would attack Russia. The president, by his character and sincerity, convinced them of that, thus removing the genuinely dangerous risk of Soviet action based on a miscalculation of our own intentions. Khrushchev felt after the conference, quote, encouraged, realizing now that our enemies probably feared us as much as we feared them. Because of this perception, Khrushchev was to use the threat of war as a bluff time and time again in his practice of foreign policy. Still, Nikita came away with a very positive impression of Eisenhower as a man and trusted his words. As he put it, I cannot judge how good Eisenhower is as a president. It is for the American people to decide that. But as a father and grandfather, I would gladly entrust my kids to him at school or a kindergarten. After the June coup in 1957, Khrushchev felt there was one man left who could and likely would topple him as the real head of the state, and that was his erstwhile ally, Marshal Georgi Zhukov. The man who had stood by him when the anti-party group had attempted their ouster of the first secretary and threatened them with military power he had behind him had actually also threatened Khrushchev in his speech denouncing the seven coup members. While he did it surreptitiously, it was a threat nonetheless, and Nikita had to do something about it. But the problem was that Zhukov was immensely popular, 
and he did have a military behind him. Or did he? Khrushchev was deeply distrustful of Zhukov, but not immediately. He was friends with the man from the 1930s and highly respected him, but he knew that if he were to achieve total control over the Soviet Union, the marshal was his only roadblock. Zhukov was not only a full member of the Presidium, he was the defense minister as well. His popularity was at its peak, as seen in his return to Leningrad in July 1957, when he was paraded down the Nevsky Prospect in an open ZIS limousine and hailed as the savior of the city by tens of thousands of people who lined the streets. But as popular as he was, he had enemies, enemies within the military. On October 4, 1957, Zhukov was sent on an official visit to Yugoslavia and Albania. As soon as he left, Khrushchev headed to Kiev for a meeting with high-ranking generals to make sure that they would back the party secretary and not their boss. It was an easy trip, as there were many in the upper ranks that were not enamored with the flamboyant Zhukov and saw his ouster as a way to move up themselves. On October 19th, the Presidium voted to condemn Zhukov. He was to find out five days later and flew into Moscow in an attempt to save his career. A central committee plenum was held on October 26th, and all that were heard were words condemning the marshal. A number of charges were brought up against him, some fabricated, some probably true. One was that he was about to take over the government using a secret commando unit based outside of Moscow. He was also said to have banned criticism of higher-ups so that the party leaders could not control the military. But it was the third charge, and likely the only real one, that hit the nail on the head, and that was that he was trying to build his own cult of personality. Of that, there was little doubt. The denunciations came hot and heavy, mostly from his comrades in the military. Marshal Rokolsky said, It wasn't that he was just rude during the war. His way of commanding was literally obscene. We heard nothing but continuous cursing and swearing mixed with threats to shoot people. Marshal Moskalenko denounced Zhukov's vanity, egoism, limitless arrogance, and narcissism. Marshal Malinovsky jumped in and decried his stubbornness, despotism, ambition, and search for self-glorification. Marshal Bagramian said, he's simply a sick man. Self-aggrandizement is in his blood. Now Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev was alone at the top of the Soviet Union. By the time of the 21st Party Congress in early 1959, it was clear to all that Khrushchev was the man. Speech after speech lauded his work and his devotion to the party. It was like they had gone back to the time of Stalin. From 1953 until October of 1957, there was a sharing of power amongst a number of people, but now only Nikita had central stage, and he would hold that for seven more years. But the price he would pay for this singular power was a change a dramatic change in personality, one that would eventually lead to his political demise in 1964. Join me next time as we follow Nikita Khrushchev's change in personality, the Berlin Crisis, the American trip, and the beginning of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. I'm going to ask you a favor again. Help me out by rating this podcast on iTunes so I can keep on moving up the history podcast list. Also, don't forget to join us on Facebook at the Russian Rulers History Podcast Group, which I might add has become quite lively, and thanks to everybody who's participating. There, you can ask a question, make a suggestion, or leave a comment. So, as always, до свидания и спасибо большое.